So in, with this series, what we're looking at is how, what we can do to ensure that we keep our salvation, what we can do to ensure that we finish this race strongly. Because as Christians, we should, we should be getting stronger every day. Like our spirit man is like a muscle. And what we need to do is we need to, we need to get into the spiritual gym so that we get stronger, so that we build up spiritual stamina, so that when the tests and the trials of this life, we are confronted with them, that we will be able to say like Jesus, that the, the prince of this world comes, but he has nothing inside of me because we will be tested in, in, in this life. The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous. That's, that's an observation that King David had, 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 had learned. Many of, are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us from all of them. The, uh, Paul said that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. So every single one of us has a cross to carry and without that cross, Jesus said, if nobody, if you don't carry your cross, that we are not worthy to be his disciples. So, yeah, we were looking at focus and seeing how focus is probably the, fir the, uh, the first and foremost virtue that we need to possess in order to make sure that we finish strongly. So I'm just going to quickly finish this and we'll move on. So the, the first thing we must do before we remain focused is to identify what we may, must be focused upon. In other words, we must have a clear vision. If I wanted to study at Harvard Law School, this would be my vision. But I would, not, I would now need to remain focused to prepare if I wanted to succeed. Personally, I cannot recall a time when I was successful in any pursuit without first focusing. Any time I have coveted after something and I have not been successful, then this was simply because I was not focused enough. I am sure the same has applied for you in your life. When it came to entering into university, gaining a place at drama school, securing a job, whatever I've successfully pursued in my life so far, in all instances uh, highlighted, I only found myself being successful because of focus. My, my focus has resulted in two things. Firstly, we minimalize all distractions and procrastination. This results in hard work. Okay, so as a Christian, there's gonna be many things that are before us that, uh, that uh, constitute distractions, Netflix, um, Sometimes for me, it's watching like all of these documentaries on, on YouTube. And I think I'm getting to a, a stage in my life with the Lord where the Lord is, is being less patient with certain things. So to be honest, if I'm, if I'm completely honest with you, when I first became saved, and that was in um, 2015, when I first became saved, God like wanted me to not watch anything. Like I, he didn't want me to watch football, he didn't want, want me to watch like any secular thing. And all I used to do was watch videos on the Lord and like watch videos about people's dreams or, you know, watch people's teachings and I'll read the Bible. And because of that, I found that in my first few months of walking with Christ, I used to have a lot of dreams about the Lord. Like I used to have a lot of dreams about prophecy. And it shows me that when we're focused on the Lord, then we're, we receive a lot more from the Lord. Like if, if, if you think about something throughout the day, you're likely to dream about that thing when you go to bed. Like Nebuchadnezzar, had, uh, the king of Babylon had a dream or he was thinking about what would happen to his kingdom after he died. And he said that literally that night, he then had a dream about the, the kingdoms that would come after him. And of course, obviously he forgot that dream, but Daniel remembered the dream and interpreted it. And that dream was given to Nebuchadnezzar because he was thinking about that thing. So the more we think about the Lord, the more we think about his word, the more that we think about, uh, about his purposes for our lives, the more we think about what is God actually doing in this season internationally, uh, nationally, within the church, within my life, the more we, we question the, these points, the more God is going to give us revelation. Because the Lord says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. And we draw near, the, the way that we draw near to God is we draw near to God with our mind. OK, we can certainly draw near to him with our spirit by praying in the spirit, by praying even in, in English. We can draw near to God by studying the word of God. But another way to draw near to God is to meditate upon him, to meditate upon his testimonies, to meditate upon his statutes, to, to meditate, meditate upon his nature, to meditate on the fact that he is there. That is what God was trying to tell Moses when Moses and the Israelites were confronted by uh, the Egyptians and they were at the Red Sea. God said, be still and know that I am Lord. We, sometimes God wants us to be still 
And when, we still, when we're still before him, we're actually offering him one of the purest sacrifices that we can give him. We're giving him the sacrifice of, of our mind. We're giving him the sacrifice of our time. We're giving him the sacrifice of our attention. God is, is desperate for our attention. The Bible says, I think we read it last week. Um, I don't know which scripture it was, but it was Psalms where it says that, let me see if I can get it. I think it's Psalms. I don't know if anyone can remember it from last week, but we looked at where it says that God looks down upon, upon the earth from heaven. Psalm 53. Yeah, man. Thank you. Psalm 53, verses 2. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there was any that did understand, that did seek God. And then if you come with me to 2 Chronicles 15, verses 2. Second Chronicles chapter 15 verses 2 and um, and we'll also read Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 16 verses 9. So Second Chronicles chapter 15 verses 2. We'll read from verse 1. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to Asher. So this is a king of Judah. Let's see. Amen. Second Chronicles 15, 1 to 2. So he went, he went to me, Asher, and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asher, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you whilst you're with him. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Amen. So God has a, a, a reciprocal relationship with us. If, we, if we're good to God, God is good to us. If we honor God, God will honor us. If we seek God, God will seek us. God, God, God basically, uh, he mirrors, he reflects whatever we show him. I think David said, with the forward, you would show yourself forward, but with the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. And Second Chronicles 16, verses 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. Amen. So God is God's heart or God's eyes is looking on the whole earth. He's looking at mankind. He's looking at their hearts and he's looking for every opportunity to manifest himself within us. Remember when God wants to manifest himself in the world, God will always look for a vessel. God will always look for an individual. God will always look for a prophet or a prophetess. Okay. There was what was literally only one time that we see God coming down on the earth. And that was in the book of Exodus when God came down to meet the children of Israel at, on Mount Sinai. And he gave them the 10 commandments. When, when we read about the 10 commandments in Exodus chapter 20, you read it, do not steal, you know, do not kill all of those commandments. Those commandments, when you're reading them, it wasn't on a stone initially. God put it on a stone. But when you read about it first, God was literally speaking from a fire. Like he came down, with the holy angels in a fire and there was an earthquake there was smoke there was trumpets and it was a terrifying sight and the children of israel cried out and they said to moses no moses we're not going to go and we don't want to be here we don't like this is too terrifying and so from that day onwards god basically made a promise and he said that look the, what these people said is fair enough i am terrifying to be honest <laughs> i am terrifying so what i will do is i will raise up a prophet like unto thee. This is a Deuteronomy. Guys, this is a Bible study, so let me get the scriptures up. So Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 18, verses 15. It says, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of my brethren, like unto me. So this is Moses. Unto him sh shall you hearken, 
Okay, so the prophet that God was going to raise up was Christ. Okay, this is this is Jesus he's speaking about. Interestingly, if you if you go and evangelize to Muslims, Muslims will bring up this scripture and they will say that this is a prophecy about Muhammad. Um, interestingly, but it's a prophecy about Jesus. Amen. Because we know that Jesus, as much as Jesus is the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, Jesus was a prophet as well. Yeah. Verse 16, according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb, Okay, so on, this is when, um, when God came down and he gave the Ten Commandments, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren. Okay, so a prophet from among their brethren, Jesus, we know, was of the tribe of Judah. So Jesus came from one of the tribes of Israel. Beloved, let's remember Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, our Messiah, he was a man and he was born from a woman. He, he, he came out of a woman's womb. He was a man, a man. And he's, he's of, you know, as Paul um, put it, he's of the seed of Abraham, of the seed of David. So he was a descendant of both Abraham and David. Amen like unto thee, and will put my words in, in his mouth. Okay, remember Jesus said, when um, Jesus was talking to the disciples, Philip said to, to Jesus, he said, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. And Jesus said, I've been with you so many days and do you not know who I am? He said that, you know, he said that, that who, he that sees me has seen the Father, that the words I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. So the, the words that Jesus was speaking were the words of the Father. The Most High God, who is a spirit, dwelt in, in Jesus, his son. Paul would go as far as saying that the fullness of the Godhead was expressed bodily in Jesus. So what does this all mean? This means that Jesus is the Son of God, but God, the Most High, is, is God. He is the Father, but the Father dwelt in the Son. And the father was manifesting himself through the son. The father was speaking through the son. The father was, was multiplying bread and fish it through the son. The father was walking on the water through the son. The father was doing all things through the son. And the father wants to do all things through us. We are also sons of God. But Jesus has preeminence over all, all creatures. Jesus Christ has received power in heaven and on, on earth. And none of us can go to the Father, the Most High God, except we come through the Son. We need to come through, 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 through the, you know, through the, um, to, to get into the Holy of Holies, we need to come through the High Priest. We need to come through the Mediator, and that man is Jesus, okay? The Bible says that Jesus is in, is in a temple in heaven. He's in the temple of God in heaven, and he's right now, he's praying for us. He's making intercession for us. Because he's the one that shed his blood on the cross for all of us. And he doesn't want anybody to die. He doesn't want anybody to perish because he paid the penalty for all of our sins on the cross. So what he wants us to do is to, to be focused. What he wants us to do is, is to follow him, to take up our cross, to forget about the things of the past. The things of the past are not going to benefit us where we're going. We're going, to, we're going into a kingdom where we can't take any of the things that, we, that we've grown or we've developed, you know, any of the physical things that we've grown or developed, we can't take those things with us. We can't take our cars, our money, even our family members, we can't take those things with us. The only thing that we can take with us is our holiness. The only thing that we can take with us awesome. are the sacrifices that we've made to please our God. So Jesus is so urgent, that like he's so urgently pressing on all of us to, to take our calling uh, to prioritize our calling above all other things. Because it, in fact, it's our calling and walking in our calling that is going to give us joy. It's walking in our calling that is going to give us peace. So Moses said, I will raise them up a prophet from among your brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in, in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. 
And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require of him. Okay, amen. So why did I bring up that scripture? Because God always uses a man. God always uses a woman. When God wants to speak, God will always raise up a prophet. Okay, because this dimension, this realm, which we call the earth, it belongs to men. The Bible says that the heavens of heaven or the heaven of heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth, he has given it to the sons of men. So if God wants to influence and manifest himself and to push his agenda and to push forth his kingdom, he will raise up John the, John the Baptist or he will raise up Elijah or he will raise up Jesus. The devil does the same thing as well. The devil doesn't openly manifest himself. The, the evil spirits, the, the, the unclean spirits that are in this world, they don't just manifest themselves. What do they look for? They look for a body. They look for a temple. And then they manifest their agenda through an individual. Satan has been doing that from the beginning. The first individual that Satan used was Eve. After Satan used Eve, he then went on to Cain. After he went on to Cain, he then went on to many other people as well. I think... Um, I could go through many other names that he went through. There was a man called Nimrod that he used as well in a time when they were building the Tower of Babel. God, you, you, uh, not God, Satan used a man called Nimrod and this man was very powerful. He was very skilled in occult knowledge. He was a brave, mighty, the Bible says he was a mighty hunter before men. He was very influential. The whole world came behind him and supported him and said, okay, let's all be one. Let us build this tower and let us, you know, let us war against the Lord. And God had to scatter them. And, 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 and from that day, people started speaking different languages. That's how influential this man was. Okay, why was this man so influential and powerful? Because this man decided to serve Satan. This man didn't serve Satan with 90% of his heart. This man served Satan with 100% of his heart. Why was Jesus so powerful? Because Jesus didn't serve God with 90% of his heart. Jesus served God with 100% of his heart. Okay, and what we're seeing with focus is that you can't, you cannot serve two masters. You, you cannot serve mammon and God. You have, to ch you have to choose either mammon or you choose God. If you, ch if you try to choose mammon and God, then what happens is that the, the, the purity of the message of the gospel is going to be defiled. It's, go it's going to be compromised. It's going to be corrupted. And by the time you know it, you will actually be amongst those people that Jesus Christ calls lukewarm. Okay, so what Jesus said is, Okay, forget about your, the riches in this world. Forget about, uh, forget about status in this world. Forget about being so influential and popular in this world. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Be hot for me. Because it's that heat that you will need in the, in the day of tribulation. It's that heat that you will need, that zeal that you will need in, in, in the day of trial for you to overcome. Do you know that when, when Daniel went into, into Babylon, there were many princes that, that went with Daniel, but we only hear of four that stood out. Meshach, Shadrach, Abednego, Daniel. And when they came into Babylon, they had the opportunities to live the most opulent of lifestyles. They had the opportunity to eat the finest meat, to, to drink the finest wine. They had it all before them. But Daniel said, I'm not, I will not defile myself with the portion of the king's meat. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they, they followed likewise. They began to fast. They began to, the moment they got there, they said, let us give our bodies over to the Lord. Let us fast. We won't eat meat. We will eat vegetable and drink water. And we were going to do that, not because we love vegetable, not because we love water, but because we've decided to, to offer up our body as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto the Lord. So they said, let's do that, let's do that. And as they started to do that, they started to get promoted. As they started to do that, they started, to, you know, uh, um, the scripture says that they were 10 times wiser than all of the, the magicians, than all of the wizards, than all of the, the witches. They were 10 times wiser than these people. They just come into the country, they learned the language quickly and they were already rising in preeminence because remember the Bible says we will be the head when we obey God's commandments. Not, we won't be the head because we're Christian. We'll be the head when we obey God's commandments and when we, we, are, we are zealous unto God. When we offer up our body as a living sacrifice, then when we do that, we, we create the correct conditions for the spirit of wisdom to come and make its home inside of our body. 
So when we're speaking, it's no longer us that's speaking, but there's a spirit that, is, that has been sent forth from God that has made its abode in us and is expressing itself through us. That is what we've been called to do. We've been called to house God. We've been called to manifest the different dimensions that he has. Our God is a, is a multifaceted God. Our God has many names. Our God has manifested himself in different ways throughout time. And God has called us in this time to manifest himself, to manifest an aspect of himself through us today. That is what, he, that is what he's doing. So let's just, let me just quickly finish this off and then we're going to get on with our study with suffering. Um, this is a principle of life, for focus guarantees so success. This is a principle which is clearly important for our pursuit of God too. If our vision is to know God and we focus upon this with all of our heart, then we will surely find him. This is why God inspired the prophet Jeremiah to say, you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all of your heart. Now, one, the reason why we need to seek God is because if we don't know God, if we don't experience God, we're never going to honor God. And if we don't honor God, then we're never going to receive everything that God has for us. Okay, honor, honoring God is the, the secret. Honoring God is the path to ensuring that prophecy that God has ordained over your life comes to pass. God has a good plan for every Christian, but the, the, those plans cannot come into fruition unless we walk in honor towards God, because God has the opportunity to cancel prophecy regarding our lives. Not every prophecy will come to pass in our lives. God told Abraham that your, your seed will be in slavery for 400 years. If you read the book of Exodus, you realize that they were in slavery for 430 years. Did God give Abraham a wrong prophecy? God did not give Abraham a wrong prophecy. But because, nobody, because Moses was, was, was called to be that man that would deliver them on the 400th year, but he was not ready. So, they had, so that prophecy had to be delayed for another 30 years. God brought Moses into the wilderness and Moses began his ministry when he was 80. God had ordained Moses to begin his ministry much younger. But Moses was not ready, so God brought him to the wilderness and trained him there for 40 years until he had that encounter with the Lord at the burning bush. So God has a prophecy for all of us, but God, God needs us to honor him before we walk in that prophecy. Amen. And to honor means to esteem highly. If you honor somebody, it means that you esteem that individually highly. You respect that individual. It implies that you obey that individual. It applies that you revere that individual. But what I'm saying is that unless we have an encounter with God, we will never fear him. We will never fear him. I, I can remember being on a Bible study one time. It was, on, um, it was a few years ago now, maybe three years. And it was um, one of Brother Benjamin's Bible studies. And we were talking about the fear of the Lord. And then there was this lady on the, on the, on the call. And she didn't understand what we were talking Because we were talking about the fear of the Lord. And in her mind it was like why fear god like he's he's our father like he's so kind like he's so loving like why should we fear god like that's not right that's not biblical and we were telling her no 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 no. it is biblical but you fear god when you meet him if you if you don't fear god it's because you've never met him because anybody that met god feared him <laughs> Look at the angels. When people met angels, people were, were <laughs> people were falling on the floor, like having heart attacks, fainting. But that's angels. What about the God of those angels? The God that has millions of angels right now before him, bowing down, worshipping him with all their power, all their strength, worshipping the God of heaven. If anybody that's encountered God, even a similitude of God, and by similitude, the Bible says that God shows himself in similitude. So that means that God shows himself in, in, in various appearances. He does, sometimes he don't show you who he truly is. He, he will show you maybe through the angel of the Lord. Sometimes you might have a dream and you may think it's just as a person and you don't even know it. it's actually God. Like I've had one of those dreams where I didn't realize who it was until after the dream. I had a dream where, um, you know, a few years ago where um, in the dream, there was a guy like he was a, he was like a light-skinned guy and he was young and 
you know, he came up to me, he was really kind and he was smiling and he, he had like this jovial manner and kind of at the end of the dream, I thought was quite immature. So in my heart, like he was going through, in fact, it's really, it's really ironic because it's what I'm doing now. But he was, he was telling me a dream that he had. And when he was telling me the dream that he had, in my heart, I started to say, oh, like, why is this guy sharing this with me? Like, and as I started murmuring in my heart those things, his eyes got like, his eyes opened. And he was like, he, he spoke to me telepathically, like, I, I'm reading your heart. I know what you're saying in your heart. I know what you're saying in your heart. So his face changed. And I just woke up. So when I had that dream, I was like, who was that? That's obviously somebody, because that, that person is not, this wasn't just a dream that you have of your mind, of your subconscious. That was a spirit. That was somebody there, because that person, he was reading my heart. He was talking to me. And not only that, I actually woke up from that dream. Like, usually you only wake up from, you know, from nightmares, or like you wake up from a dream that God wants to wake you up from so that you can remember the dream, because often we might forget the dream. So I was like, who is that person? Who is that person? And I think that person has to be Christ. So yeah. it, is it, it, does Christ look exactly like that? Christ may not look exactly like that, but he appears in similitudes. When, when he was raised from the dead, none of his disciples even recognized him. They said is it, they thought he was a gardener. Like Mary, who had walked with him for three and a half years, he, I think he, he, he was like, oh, why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? And she was like, oh, great. you know, our Messiah's died. And he started speaking to her. And then she realized, and then there was, in, in Luke 24, it says, on, I think on the road to Emmaus, there was a man there and like all these disciples were crying and he was like, why are you crying? And they were like, oh, you know, prophet, uh, you know, from Galilee, mighty in word and deed has just passed. And he was like, oh, fools, like, do you not believe what the prophets have told you? Like, and the Psalms have testified and then they clocked it was Christ. So I believe strongly that all, a lot of us have encountered him, but Christ will not come to you in regalia. Christ, Christ will, will show the world, it will come to the world in regalia at the end with the angels and with the saints. That's when he will show everybody who he really is. The Bible says that you know, in Revelation chapter one, that all eyes shall behold him. In fact, Revelation chapter one. Revelation chapter one verses, or verses four to seven. Or first, I'll read from verses four to eight. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are, which are before his throne. Amen. Remember I said earlier on that with Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego, they, they, they prepared themselves in a way that their bodies could become hosts for these spirits of God, the seven spirits of God. Okay, in Isaiah, uh, I believe it's Isaiah chapter 13 or, or Isaiah chapter 14, or maybe Isaiah chapter 11, sorry. It talks about uh, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of might, the spirit of the fear of the Lord and the spirit of the Lord. Those, many people believe those are the seven spirits of the Lord. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And he has made us kings and priests unto God his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So when Christ comes everybody will know it's him because <laughs> the Bible says that people will start crying. So I think everybody's going to know when he comes back that somebody's, somebody's coming here to take, to take control of this world. And he, he's not like, you know, he, he's, he doesn't have a smile on his face at all. He's, he's, he's coming here to wage war. And we read of that. Uh, I'm kind of sidetracking here, but I just want to um, just read this quickly. Revelation chapter 19 verses 11. So this is Jesus's return. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. Now, this is what I'm saying. When you have an encounter with God, 
are you not gonna you how are you not gonna fear him when isaiah saw god he said woe is unto me because i am a man of unclean lips and i dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips and my eyes have seen the lord when jacob wrestled with the angel all night he said woe unto me i've seen the lord when uh, i think i believe it's the the father of of samson Sorry, when, when the father of Samson saw an angel of the Lord, he said, I've seen the Lord and I'm going to die. When you see the Lord or you see a similitude of the Lord, you will fear him. Amen. His eyes was, uh, was the flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon a white horse, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of his fierceness and the wrath of the almighty God. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a, a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. So that's how Jesus Christ is going to return. Amen. So um, let's move on. And if we can just quickly go to Romans chapter 6. Amen. Romans chapter 6. Amen. So it says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Amen. Now, when you were baptized, basically you were at your funeral. You were literally, <laughs> your baptism is like your funeral because your baptism is the, is the day that you decided to die. Okay. One, um, one pastor that I listened to says that there are two people that want to kill you, God and Satan, but they want to kill you in different ways. Like God wants to kill your flesh. Like God wants to kill your old man. And when, when, you, when you were baptized, what it actually symbolized when you went under the water, it symbolized that you were dead because it's, it's kind of like a, a burial, you going under the water. But then obviously when you're, you're brought up, that's representing you being raised from the dead. It, it's representing you having a resurrected life, a, a life which is holy, a life, which is spiritual, because none of us before our baptism, none of us before we decided to live a Christian was a good person. The Bible says there's nothing that dwells in our flesh that is good. So even if we were Jews and we were abiding by the law and we kept the law to a good standard, we would still not be holy before the Lord. We would still not be righteous before the Lord. In fact, the scripture says that our righteousness is as filthy rags before the Lord. So what happened is when we, were, when we were baptized, we were decided to die to our flesh. We decided to die to our ambition. And when we were brought out, we were declaring to God that now we want to live a life full of the Holy Spirit. Now we want to live a resurrected life. Amen. So let me just read a few of these points. So when we were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, we were initiated into his body. This means that we became a part of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ becomes a part of us. This happens after we were baptized into his body by the Holy Ghost. Now, notice there, there are different baptisms. There, there was a baptism of John, the baptism of repentance, and that is the, the, the immersion in the water. Jesus Christ went through that baptism, baptism as well. But there's also the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And the baptism of the Holy Ghost that's the one that Jesus does. When, if you have the Holy Spirit, 
do you know that means that Jesus himself literally called you and he literally from heaven, you know, from his place in heaven, he literally poured the Holy Spirit from, from, from the temple he's in in heaven. On, from being on the right hand of the Father, he literally poured his spirit upon you from heaven. You know how, you remember the same thing happened to Jesus. Jesus got baptized by John and then the Bible says that the heavens opened and the spirit came down like a dove and it abode upon him. That was when Jesus was, was being baptized by the Holy Ghost. To be baptized means to be immersed. It means that you're completely engulfed. It means that you become part of the same nature of the thing that baptizes you. For instance, if you put, <laughs> this is, if you put a Maggie cube in stew, you're baptizing the Maggie cube in the stew and the Maggie cube becomes part of the stew. It becomes one of the same nature of the stew. So similarly, when we are baptized by the Holy Ghost, we, we are becoming one of the same nature of God. We, be, we become like God. Okay, we become like Jesus. Amen. So we are part of Jesus and Jesus is a part of us. We become inseparable. This is, this is what Paul said. He said that this is a mystery I speak of, not of marriage, but of, you know, not of a marriage between a man and a woman, but a ma the marriage between the church and Jesus Christ. Because two shall become one flesh. That's the same thing that happens with us and Jesus. We become one flesh. And that's why the Bible says our body is a temple unto God. That we need to, we need to revere the Lord by hosting this body in, with holiness, with cleanliness. And anytime we fall short, we need to repent quickly. Well, you know, even as the Bible says, the Bible says that, look, if you have a, a, an issue with your enemy or with your adversary, be at peace, you know, make peace with him quickly. Before the sun sets, make peace with him straight away. The same thing applies with us and the Lord. If we've done something, make peace with him straight away. He, he will forgive us. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 13. For, what, for by one spirit are you all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be, we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Jesus Christ is the way. He shows us the way to live life, and his life was a living testimony of what we must do to inherit eternal glory. The only way to eternal glory is through the cross. The only way to gain eternal life is through the pathway of death. This is what baptism communicates to us. When we were submerged into the water, this symbolizes our death to the old man, our death to the flesh with all of its carnal lusts and inclinations. Okay, so the old man is who we used to be before we came to Christ. And the old man is our testimony. The old man is, is, is somebody that used to smoke, somebody that used to watch porn, somebody that was vicious, somebody that, that had malice, somebody that was envious, somebody that used to fight and squabble. That is the old man, somebody that was selfish, somebody that didn't have the fear of the Lord, somebody that never prayed, somebody that maybe was religious, went to church here and there, but somebody that, that never decided to give their life to God somebody that didn't know God, that didn't fear him. That's the old man. But when we were submerged into the water, this symbolized our death to the old man, our death to the flesh. Okay, we no longer live for the flesh. We don't wake up thinking about the flesh. We don't wake up or go to bed dreaming about how can I, how can I fulfill this desire of the flesh? Now our desires are different. We have, now our lusts are different. Everybody has a lust. Everybody has an addiction. But the type of addiction that you have depends upon whether you've been born once or whether you've been born twice. If you've been born again, then your lusts are of the spirit. But if you've only been born once, if you've been born, of, or, you know, born carnally, then your, your desires is of the flesh. Jesus said that which is of the flesh is flesh. That which is of the spirit is spirit. So we need to be born again of the spirit, born again of the word of God. It symbolizes our desire to suffer and to deny the loss of the flesh. Okay, Saying no to, to the loss of the flesh is suffering in of itself. It actually is suffering. Fasting, that's a form of suffering. Praying is a form of suffering. Okay, 
they're, they're dimensions of prayer, deep dimensions of prayer that literally become like wrestling. You're wrestling spirits. You're wrestling, uh, you know, evil spirits. You're wrestling principalities. Jesus Christ was praying, and he said that and as he was praying, he started, to, he started to sweat blood. That's how serious his prayers were. So pr prayer, prayer in itself is a form of suffering, especially if you're praying for hours upon hours. James the Apostle, um, you can read about James the Apostle. He obviously wrote um, an epistle, James, the brother of Jesus. It, it's, it's commonly reported that his knees, like, they were messed up. They were just completely messed up. Like, they, apparently they were like camel knees. I've never seen a camel knee before, but they were messed up. And it's because he was always on his knees praying. That's how he lived his life. That's suffering. Saying no, saying no when people persecute you. You, you have power. Remember John, John and James said, oh, Lord, should we call down fire like Elijah upon the, you know, the Samaritans because they're rejecting the word. And Jesus said, we're not of that spirit. You do not know what spirit we're of. We've not come to destroy life. We've come to save life. So even that desire to want to curse your enemy, that desire to want to show them that you're, the, that you're the one in power, to show them that you're the king, to show them that you're the priest, to show them that they're, they're messing with the wrong person, that needs to be denied. That's another form of suffering. The, the, being a Christian is about saying no to the flesh. Okay, being a Christian is about circumcision, circumcision of the heart. Okay, because let, let me be let me be balanced here. Because by what I'm saying, some of some may believe that I'm saying you say no to all the flesh. So I'm saying you don't eat. I'm saying you don't eat good food. You don't drink good drink. You don't uh, you know you don't have children. You don't do these things. I'm not saying you don't do those things. You can still do those things but you do those things in moderation. That's what circumcision about is about. When, when God called Abraham, Abraham was an old man at this stage, and God said to him, look, I'm going to make a covenant with you, but if you want to have this covenant, you have to now circumcise yourself. Abraham was probably in his 80s, in his 90s, when God told him this. So Abraham circumcised himself, his whole household, his son Ishmael, they were all circumcised, and they were all adults. And what circumcision is about is removing excess from your life. That's what circumcision communicates. Because a man, when he's circumcised, when you remove the foreskin, the foreskin is actually excess skin. It's, it, ha it actually has no purpose whatsoever. And actually it's cleaner for a man to actually be circumcised than to have the foreskin. It's actually cleaner, safer for him to, to have that. People that have uh, foreskin, they, they're, they're more prone to to infections so circumcision is about removing excess from your life so we who are christian the life of a christian is a life of circumcision but it's it, circumcision is in reference to the heart removing excesses in your life that are not needed so am i saying you can't watch netflix i'm not saying you can't watch not netflix but when you were in the world, you watched Netflix for two hours, three hours every day. Now you're, in a Christian, now you're a Christian, you need to realize that that's excess. That's excess, that's too much. That's two or three hours that could have been used in the world. That's two or three hours that could have been used on your knees. That's two or three hours that could have been used on developing your gifts so that when you come out of the wilderness, like Moses came out of the wilderness, you're now willing to come and show people, the people of God, signs and wonders. You're not just coming in your strength. You're coming, you're coming with the support of the God that you've spent so much time with in the secret place. Now you're not convincing or persuading people about God. Now you're coming out of the secret place. Your face is shining like the sun. It becomes undeniable that, that the God that you serve is the only true God. So it's about circumcision. You know, when Joshua took over the mantle with Moses, God appeared to Joshua and God said, all these people are with you. They can't enter into the promised land unless they're circumcised. So there were many men there that were not circumcised. And God said, look, circumcise them all now. 
Otherwise, they're not coming into, into Israel. They're not coming into the promised land. None of us can enter into God's promised land without circumcision. And that promised land is available now. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God does not come with observation. You don't need to die to get to paradise. You don't need to die to receive heaven. The kingdom of God is not in meat and in drink. The kingdom of God is in life. The kingdom of God is in peace, it's in joy, it's in righteousness, in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, is within you. But to experience that kingdom and to experience the bliss that God provides, you need to circumcise. You need to cut off that excess. And so this is what this is saying about denying the lust of the flesh. It's not saying that you can't enjoy the flesh, although that is not our priority. It's not saying that you can't enjoy food, you can't enjoy sex if it's done within marriage. You can enjoy all those things. But what it's saying is that you need to cut off the excess. You need to cut off the, you know, everything else that God has told you not to do. Cut those things out. It symbolizes, let's check the time. We're going to finish at, at 10, so we're just going to close in five minutes. It symbolizes our desire to suffer and to deny the loss of the flesh so that the life of Jesus Christ might be made manifest through our mortal body, through our mortal bodies. This is what being a Christian is all about. So, Jesus lives on the inside of us, okay? Remember, when we were baptized by the Spirit, we became a part of Jesus, and Jesus became a part of us. We are now in his body. So Jesus lives on the inside of us, but the life of Jesus is expressed when we crucify the flesh. Jesus Christ can be dormant, or Jesus Christ can be expressive. Now, although we, 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 we've come into Christ, we can still revert back to the ways of the old man. It's still a possibility. But when we walk in the new man, which is Jesus, remember the, the old man is Adam. That's who the old man is. The old man is, is, is literally Adam. The new man is, is Jesus. And all of us are of the seed of Adam. All of us were of the seed of Adam. Remember there's two births. The first birth is the, is the birth of Adam. The second birth is the birth of Jesus. So when we were born, we were born of the seed of Adam. We're all descendants of Adam and we've all inherited his traits. We've in we inherited that fallen trait, that fallen state. We're all born into sin. All of us have sinned. But then God sent that prophet that we read of in the book of Deuteronomy. God sent a prophet. God sent a, the second Adam into the world, the new man. So every day... Is a, is a battle between us walking in the old man and us walking in the new man. And the, the way that we walk in the new man is by denying the old man, by putting that man to death, by crucifying him. First Peter uh, chapter 4, verses 1 to 2. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same man, with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer lived the rest of his life, of his time in the flesh, to the loss of men, but to the will of God. The life of Jesus Christ can only be made manifest in our bodies when we decide to daily crucify the loss of the flesh. The flesh needs to be subdued in order to empower the Holy Ghost who is dormant within. Okay, Paul said, quench not the Holy Ghost. So that means Although we've all received the Holy Spirit, the, the Spirit of God can be quenched. The Spirit of God can be grieved. But we can also have the opportunity to be full of the Spirit. And when we're full of the Spirit, the life that we're living is the life of Jesus. Amen. It's the life of Jesus. When, when Peter and uh, John stood before the Sanhedrin, they were preaching so hard and they were preaching with boldness and they were so eloquent. They were not preaching with, 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 with wisdom of men. They were preaching with the spirit of God. And all the people in the Sanhedrin, they said when they saw the boldness of these men and saw that they were simple men, <laughs> they were unlearned men, they didn't go to school. They said that they, they, they looked at them and said that these men had spent time with Jesus. These were the same people that crucified Jesus, that hated Jesus. But when they noted how wise these men were, despite their background, they said, no, these ones have spent time with Jesus. The more time you spend with Jesus, the more you become like Jesus. That is what Jesus wants in all of us. He do, we're not here 
to, to, to express ourselves. We're here to express Jesus. The Holy Ghost wants to seek expression in, all, in each of our lives, but this can only happen if we give him the power to do so. Paul said, I daily die, or I die daily. This means Paul died to his own will. He crucified his will. He said yes to Christ and no to himself. This is what he meant when he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. Guys, is there anybody that wants to share anything? Amen. Amen. Father God, we, we bless you, Lord, uh, for today. We thank you, Lord God, for this time. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that every single one of us here, Lord, will continue to be in your spirit, Lord God, that as we go forth this next, for this next week, Lord, that we would die or you would at least give us the strength to die to our flesh, Lord. We pray that each and every one of us would become more spiritual, that we would, we would learn, Lord, to manifest you, Lord God, not ourselves anymore. Father, Lord God, let us not be like Adam, but let us be like Jesus. Father God, I pray for all my brothers and sisters here. I just pray, Lord God, that you touch them tonight, Lord God. Father God, that you touch them, Lord God. You touch them, Lord God, with a touch that they will never forget in their lives. Lord, I just pray that all of us, Lord God, will be filled with your spirit. And all of, all of the children that, some of us don't have children, some of us will have children, some of us do have children. I pray, Lord God, not only for ourselves, but also for our children, that you will fill them up also, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, Lord God, that they too, Lord God, will be part of your body. Father God, let us do those things that please you, Lord. Father, forgive us where we've fallen short. Father God, anoint every single one of us, Lord God, with power, with the Holy Ghost, with righteousness. Lord, none of us will, 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 will finish prematurely, will finish at the time you have ordained. And Lord, and I just pray that every one of us will receive hundredfold, Lord. Father, not by our strength, but by your, your grace, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Father, keep us, heal us, Lord God, from any infirmity, where we need healing in our hearts, where we need healing in any area of our lives, Lord, let your spirit heal us, Lord. Father, root out distractions from our lives, procrastination from our lives, and use us, God, for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, guys, thank you so much, and hopefully I'll see you on Tuesday. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Mother Faye.